to get started. So I want to say welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for being here with us tonight. We're so excited to have Dr. Jack Coulihan with us. He is the president of our board of trustees. And this is such a wonderful event. We get to have him and share him with so many people from so many different places, as we just learned. And I'm going to come back in just one second. You can see our sponsor screen right now. OK, there we go. You want to talk? I just want to make sure that everyone uh, knows to yeah. mute. Hey, everybody. Quickly. <laughs> Very popular, Jack. We have a lot of people <laughs> here. And we will have a Q&A at the end of the program. So if you have questions, write them down uh, while the poetry reading is going on so that you can sort of collect them and we can uh, ask Dr. Jack Coolhan all of our questions at the end. All right. So the first thing I wanna do is say thank you so much to everyone who donates of, to our programs. That's what makes this possible. And without your donations, we wouldn't be able to reach so many people as I was saying, uh, to be growing the community so much, to be sharing Walt Whitman and his legacy with so many people and to be sharing contemporary poets' voices with so many people, like we are here tonight. So thank you so much to everyone who donates. It means so much to us, even small amounts. Uh, I know that a lot of people are struggling right now, but any amount means multitudes to us right now, especially. So thank you so much. All right. And so our director, our executive director, Dr. Cynthia, oh, I can't talk today, I'm sorry. <laughs> Our executive director, Cynthia Shore, uh, couldn't be with us tonight. Uh, we had a lot of technical issues today and she was so sad that she wasn't able to be here, but she wanted me to say thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, thank you to the whole community that's here and she wanted to wish you good luck tonight, Jack. So I just wanna make sure that we uh, share that. So. I'm going to be introducing uh, Dr. Maria Basil, and she is our Board of Trustees Secretary currently. And I'm going to, very briefly, Maria is a phys physician poet interested in the medical humanities, specifically literature and medicine and narrative medicine. Dr. Basil is the Chief Medical Officer and Medical Director at U.S. Family Health Plan. She is currently the Secretary of WWBA Board of Trustees. Thank you for being with us, Maria, and introducing Jack. I'm going to give you the spotlight right now. Thanks, Maria. Caitlin, thank you for that introduction, and welcome everyone tonight to our um, to our very, very special poetry reading of uh, Dr. Coolahan's new book. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce my friend and mentor, Dr. Jack Coolahan. And I've known Jack for over a dozen years, during which we have struggled and he has helped me struggle to understand our hyphenated identities as physician poets. So what does it mean to be a physician poet um, and he absolutely exemplifies this. He uses the skills of a poet, the attention to detail, the representation of another's experience, and the affiliation with all that is human and binds us. But he also brings to every poem he writes the best qualities of a physician, the ability to build trust to demonstrate compassion, to provide stability, and to inspire hope. And I know that you'll hear all of these elements in every poem that he writes. And in fact, I found the perfect poem to demonstrate this before he does with all of the rest of his. And this is a poem from uh, um, an earlier book by Jack called Medicine Stone. Um, the one thing that most of, actually all of Jack's poems um, exemplify is the way that physicians sometimes are in awe of their patients and sometimes they actually kind of fall in love with their patients. 
Um, and so I've seen that in many, many of his poems. And this one I picked out because it actually is about two people that Jack and I are both in awe of and in love with. And so the title of this poem is Sir William Osler Remembers His Call on Walt Whitman. I took the ferry that day and found him in the front room of a small house on Mickle Street, buried to his chest in papers, magazines, and musty brown bundles. Push yourself a path, he said. I reckon you're a friend of Buck's. His famous head had aged majestically, unkempt white beard, smooth, clear cheeks, a fissured geographic forehead. His voice was pitched a shade too high, but strong like the rest of him. Of symptoms, he said but little. Remarkable for a man of 65. For a moment, I felt that sweet, aromatic presence his disciples speak of. But for me, though, it was the edge of chaos. I often wish the man had made more of a difference in my life, but how could I forego restraint or become attached to a poet's strong magnetic force? For a professional like myself, his unruliness galled and festered, though in the end, I succumbed to his charm and savored the music of his tongue. But with restraint, I would not cross the line between us, nor pass the gate that says, who enters here abandons discipline. Ladies and gentlemen, my friend and mentor, Dr. Jack Kool-Aid. Hi, Jack. All right, I have this spotlight on you. We're all set. Hi, everybody. I, first, I want to thank Caitlin and the Walt Whitman Birthplace Association and Maria in particular for that wonderful, wonderful introduction. And I want to thank all of you for joining me this evening. I think it's um, marvelous that so many people have decided to uh, come and enter our little virtual room to listen to poetry tonight. And I'd like to start with a, with a recognition that we're in a very, very difficult time in our country and in the world uh, because of the pandemic and the economic consequences and the uncertainty. And one thing that has been constant in our country over the last four months is the applause for the frontline workers, the physicians, the nurses, the other healthcare workers, the EMTs, who are putting their lives on the line and working extra hours, extra time to care for COVID patients. And this reminds me, I wanted to start with a poem that, that it was evoked by another physician. Uh, his name was Anton Chekhov. And in the late 1800s in Southern Russia, he too was in uh, a position where he was facing an epidemic, in this case, a cholera epidemic. And he was the, he actually volunteered. He wasn't uh, official, but he volunteered to take over the public health uh, program to try to stamp out cholera in his region. And he worked night and day for several months doing this. And at that time, uh, the Russian people, particularly the peasants who lived in that area, were very, very skeptical about the epidemic, about what was causing the epidemic, about who they should blame for the epidemic. And since 
things like that are happening in our country right now, I thought it would be appropriate to read a poem called Cholera by, uh, regarding Anton Chekhov. And let me show you a visual here as I read the poem. It's called Cholera, and it takes place in 1892. The epidemic bursts from Astrakhan and roars north, pushing flames of panic in front of it. They say the corpse's muscles twitch for hours after death, and peasants whisper that the dead still speak. Priests take to the road with their icons, pestering their saints for forgiveness. A crowd of ruffians enters the room we are storing the drugs in and smashes the bottles. You wouldn't believe their stories. They say the doctors are causing the outbreak. It's a scheme to keep the population down. They say big government is behind the conspiracy. We who work in the field are dupes. We are the tools of perdition. Cholera seems to strike for no reason. It hits the vigorous, the young spill their guts. The peasants place their bets on evil, the doctors or the czars as the source of it. How can they face life if death is meaningless? They run to the clinic, they bludgeon the doors, they chase out the sick, escape from the death house. There is enough truth in their ignorance to make you wonder, enough calamity in their passion to deepen the burden. Much of the theme that goes through my book and through many of my poems is the balance or the tension between tenderness and steadiness, between compassion and dis detachment, objectivity and subjectivity that is really at the heart of medicine, and medical practice. And our first experience with that uh, as medical students comes in the very, very beginning of medical school when we're confronted with a human cadaver and asked to dissect it. And so I thought I would enjoy, I thought you would enjoy hearing the poem that is inspired by that experience. It's called anatomy lesson. When I move your body from its storage drawer, I brush my knuckles earnest on your three days growth of beard. Cheeks wet with formaldehyde prickle like cactus. My eyes burn and blink as if a wind of sand blew through the room. Bless me, Ernest for I cut your skin to learn positions and connections of your parts. Caves, canyons, fissures, faults, all of you, show me, show me your flowers, your minerals, the oil of your spleen. Do not mistake these tears. These tears are not for your bad luck, nor my indenture here but for all offenses to the heart, yours, mine, for the violence of abomination. Think of my tears as rain staining your canyon walls, filling your stream, touching the blossoms. Fortunately, most of the role models that we have in medical school are good role models who demonstrate compassion and steadiness in, in to some proportion or another. 
And one of the best that I ever had back in the late 1960s when I was in medical school was a Jamaican physician whom I spent three months working with in Western, in the mountains of Western Jamaica. He was an elderly man who had uh, been a major public health physician in the Caribbean and in fact had been awarded the Order of the British Empire by the Queen for his work. But he was also a Seventh-day Adventist preacher. And so while he worked in medicine six days a week, he preached in Adventist churches on the seventh day. And I, I'd like to give you an image as I read this poem. That's 1968. And that is me and Dr. Harold Johnson. The poem is called Jerusalem. My black father touches a poinsettia bush on his morning walk. And from the back, he looks like a praying mantis. He walks out to greet the ice man, the son of Jamaica. My father asks for a little more time to answer my questions, to give me the words that I need. He pleads for patience. We drive through pits between the hills to see a hundred sick at clinic. They cry for the belly. They toss at night. Their skin prickles with jaundice. Their sores will not heal. My father fills their empty cola champagne bottles with tart black medicine. He delivers a thousand from death by putting a knife to their bodies, a thousand from death by spraying the swamps for mosquitoes, a thousand from death by preaching the gospel. The queen receives him in London and gives him the empire. My father puts the British empire into a drawer of memories. We sing to, we listen to hymns in the dark. We listen to fierce cries of Jamaica, so compelling that crabs lumber toward them. My father takes me to Kingston, a city smoldering under the weight of tin and grease. He eats vegetables, peritum and postum. I take peppered crayfish and chicken. My father asks for a little more time he begs me some patience for the future. Later, when I see him swollen like an old tree dying of fungus, still he brings me visions of Jerusalem, a black city full of his sons. Doctors also have a tendency to be inspired by their patients. And as Maria said, sometimes we fall in love with our patients. Um, and so I'd like to read you three poems that relate to experiences, interactions with patients. The first one is called Vladimir and Anita. And this was a poem based on an experience when my colleagues and I were running a, a sort of poetry workshop or discussion group on the oncology ward at Stony Brook Hospital. And this relates to two patients, one whom I call Vladimir and the other Anita. And the name of the poem is Vladimir and Anita. Anita, whose course of radiation hasn't sprung the tiniest leak in her character, tells me 
the blues that crawl each morning into her bed are masculine. The icicle jitters that slip under her skin each evening are feminine. She gets rid of the men by belting, what a friend we have in Jesus, until the nurses come and shush her. She relies on the spirit to hustle those petulant women out of the room. Anita is calm. Vladimir, whose battle with cancerous marrow has taught him to dissect the brain's intoxicated ticks, wags a pear-shaped head made shiny by steroids. I expect him to explain Anita's deficits, superstition, dullness, delirium. Last evening in the family room, he lectured on the physics of the gamma knife to his roommate's daughter, whose son resembles his own. I am shaken by surprise when Vladimir kisses Anita's hand. In um, 1994, there was a huge celebration around the country celebrating the 50th anniversary of D-Day in Normandy. And at the time, I was taking care of a, a young man, a 30-year-old man who had um, uh, malignant sarcoma, and he had just had his arm amputated for the sarcoma. And in this case, um, I'd like to share an image as we think about this patient. Those are men having got it on their landing ships ready to go to the beach at D-Day. The name of this poem is D-Day 1994, and it's written for this patient. Your arm is gone to cancer at 30. There's no honor in that. The potato-like stump is not where the pain is. You take your pills and watch TV, where beaches in France swim with images of old men pacing the coast for the first time since going down. You notice their limps and imagine the vacancies, fear, lost limbs, their buddies dead. Who would have thought that first tide of grunts attacking that fortified coast could win the war. You ask me if a scan would explain the pain in your phantom limb, believing that a scan is like a story that reveals things. Those men creeping the gray crossed breast of a hill on the coast of France, they know what they lost. They know what they are looking for. The scan will not give you an answer. You are looking in the wrong place for an answer. The world works hard to hide its D-Day. Deception, danger, death, deliverance. I wish I could give you the old men's stories. I wish I could give you their battles, which are almost used up, but still good. Another patient that had inspired me to write was a man who was dying of metastatic cancer of the lungs. And he was in the hospital and actively dying. 
within the last couple of days of his life. He was on a morphine drip. And in those days, x-rays were actually films rather than just virtual images on a screen. And oftentimes we would carry the films with us and take them into the room and hold them up to the light and look at them. And so this is a poem based on, um, based on an experience with this man. It's called The Man with Stars Inside. Deep in this old man's chest, a shadow of pneumonia grows. I watch Antonio shake with a cough that traveled here from the beginning of life. As he pulls my hand to his lips and kisses my hand, Antonio tells me, for a man whose death is gnawing at his spine, Pneumonia is a welcome friend, a friend who reaches deep between his ribs without a sign, and puff, a cloud begins to squeeze so delicately the great white image of his heart. The shadow on his x-ray grows each time Antonio moves, each time a nurse smooths lotion on his back or puts a fleece between his limbs. Each time he takes a sip of ice and his moist chest shakes with cough, the shadow grows. In that delicate shadow is a cloud of gas at the galaxy's center, a cloud of cold, stunned nuclei beginning to spin, spinning and shooting a hundred thousand embryos of stars. I listen to Antonio's chest where stars crackle from the past and hear the boom of blue giants newly caught and the snap of white dwarves coughing, spinning. The second time Antonio kisses my hand, I feel his dusky lips reach out from everywhere in space. I look at this place his body was and see inside the stars. One of the things we do in medicine, or one of our, I guess, privileges is to um, be able to ask questions about private matters and give kind of private instructions that other people don't get to give. And one of the things that uh, is quite common, uh, and it used to be done by doctors, now tends to be done by assistants, is to tell people to take off their clothes. Um, and so thinking of that, I wrote this poem. It's called, appropriately enough, Take off your clothes. I was taught to include specific detail, like down to your underpants and socks, or all but your panties and bra, whichever may apply. And season my request with modest withdrawal. I'll step out of the room for a moment now and follow this with the obvious, and then I'll come back. I was taught always to offer a gown, frequently, folded backwards and faded, and to tell the patient, put the opening behind in this sheet across your lap. In the next step, I learned to uncover the roots of bewilderment, beginning with the eyes and continuing down, a performance laden with gesture encouraging hope. I delivered my script, and you, my intimate companion, you were consigned to endure the suspense of me reading a narrative 
in your flesh. More recently, uh, especially since I retired, I would go and spend my morning, uh, a good part of my morning, at Starbucks, uh, having my morning coffee and reading the paper. And I became friendly with uh, a man at first who was transitioning to become a woman. And she inspired me to write this poem. It's called Metamorphosis at Starbucks. Knobs appear between a drab sweater. He comes in wearing a dark skirt and gypsy blouse. When he sits at a table near me, I notice the scarlet nails. In a short time, I switch to the pronoun he, she prefers. Several mornings a week, we sit, our backs to the windows, two tables apart. When a story appears in the Times on a marvel of medicine, she brings it to my attention, addressing me as doctor. I'm surprised her voice hasn't softened. Her poise remains masculine. Her breasts become larger but her face and arms, though smoother, reveal the same sharp scaffolding. With regard to an article that touts the advances in gene therapy, she becomes flustered at my lack of enthusiasm. With regard to a piece about a theatrical new cure for depression, I suggest reserving just a pocket of doubt. In the months that follow, her salt and pepper hair remains dull, her makeup impasto, her posture graceless. Metamorphosis has ground to a halt. Though trinkets of change continue to accumulate, each morning I look for a difference I can't put my finger on, but have faith will shine through when it happens. I yearn to nudge her, to tip her toward happiness. She's not like those miracles in the paper. She's real. Um, when I was young, I practiced on the Navajo uh, Indian Reservation. And um, subsequently, I was involved in a major study of heart disease among uh, Native Americans in several uh, reservations, including the Oglala Sioux people at Wounded Knee, South Dakota. And one summer, I was there and I was invited to attend a Sundance, which is a complex healing ceremony uh, at which men or women who are suffering from serious life problems um, dance and fast for several days, usually in the hot sun, and they dance around a pole. And at some point when they're really ready to experience a transformation, they are hooked by, from the chest under the skin to the pole. Uh, but during that time, there's a ceremony in which the participant, the observers, the people who have come to uh, support the uh, patients are invited to come up and um, be blessed by the medicine man and by the uh, participants in the Sundance. And this is a poem I wrote um, about my experience of that um, ceremony. It's called Medicine Stone. This stone I picked at a medicine dance on a cold June day at Wounded Knee. In my bare feet, I carried this stone into the circle of those with need. A sun dancer danced in front of me and touched my shoulder with a sprig of sage. A sun dancer chanted in front of me 
and blessed me with his medicine pipe. Here in the city, the sky is brilliant. I carry this stone in a buckskin pouch. Here in the city, we suffer in private. Each of us stands at the circle alone. This stone is an aspect of soul that lasts. This stone is a remnant of no account. Here in the hospital, Coyote is dead. The small stone is of no account. Wolves, spiders, moles, snakes, ants are dead. This spherical stone is of no account. Hummingbirds, ravens, bats are dead. This stone is a remnant of no account. Only the voices of suffering live, the skin and what's beneath the skin. Still, I carry this buckskin pouch and a small stone wrapped in a wad of, faith, of sage. This stone is an aspect of soul that lasts. I call it my friend, Black Stone Friend. Let me just share this with you. That was um, an image of the Sundance. But let me move on. Um, the next poem is called CCM 137. And it is um, uh, based on an experience, on an episode that happened in September of 1987 at uh, Guiana, Brazil, where, as you can see from the image, uh, some doctors, uh, when they abandoned their clinic, left the radiotherapy machine, which had 1,400 curies of cesium-137 in it. And uh, some children came in a, to the dump where it was and decided to play with it. This is the poem. In a field scattered with axles, fenders, sets of steel wheels, whole bodies of cars, Children discover the marvelous powder. At twilight, they return with their friends to revel in its phosphorescence. One child smears cesium on his arms and climbs beneath an abandoned car to augment the glow. His sister makes rouge of the powder on her cheeks and tastes the miraculous stuff. Others shove dabs into their pockets and plastic purses. This is the treasure they had hoped to discover, the cairn of their small lives burst open beyond their parents' drab existence, their loveliness aglow at last. The children begin to die within the day, heads smoldering, mucosa raw, their bodies vacillate and weaken, hour by hour, consumed by innocence and radiant desire. This poem is a little, um, I wrote it before the current pandemic. It's called the C Conference of Germs. And I read it, read it really as a kind of ironic comment on the fact that 
we human race uh, are destroying and uh, unbalancing the environment and causing global warming and pollution and so forth. But it has become uh, particularly appropriate in this era of the pandemic. And so I will read it, um, The Conference of Germs. In time, the bacteria will convene a conference to consolidate their plans for coping with the loss of humans. Those who colonize the humans will be welcomed with respect and given appropriate support, acknowledging it was not their fault. The germs who live in volcanic cracks will offer workshops on the simple life, others on fixing nitrogen. The more scholarly germs will tackle the history of devastation and specifically the ingenious methods that humans used to eradicate their species. Poet germs will sing of humans sniping, snipping wisdom from their reproductive strands. The principal theme will be the future. Every germ will vow to continue molding the planet as duty demands. At um, one time I was uh, a medicine consultant uh, called to see a, a surgical patient who um, had, after his cholecystectomy, had some hallucinations and <clears throat> agitation. And just because of the fact that he was kind of a rough guy, uneducated, uh, used a lot of four-letter words and so on, the, and he had a big red nose too. Uh, the, uh, the surgeons thought that he was uh, an alcoholic and they wanted to treat him for DTs. And so they called in uh, a medicine consult. And of course, he, he wasn't really having DTs. Uh, ultimately, it turned out that he was having a uh, reaction to the anesthetic, but uh, he was very angry that the, they wouldn't listen to him when he said they, he didn't drink and so on. And they kind of um, trivialized him uh, and wouldn't speak to him. And he got very angry and <clears throat> I kind of tried to imagine myself in his position. And I wrote a poem in his voice as to what he would say to the surgeons uh, if he could. And it's called, I'm going to slap those doctors. Because the rosy condition makes my nose bumpy and big, and I give them the crap they deserve, they write me off as a boozer and snow me with drugs. Like I'm going to go wild and green bugs are going to crawl on me, and I'm going to tear out their goddamn precious IV. I haven't had a drink in a year. But those slick bastards cross their arms and talk about sodium. They come with their noses crunched up like my room is purgatory and they're the goddamn angels doing a bit of social work. Listen, I might not have much of a body left, but I've got good arms. The polio left me that and the skin on my hands is about an inch thick. And when I used to drink, I could hit with the best in Braddock. Listen, one more shot of the crap that makes my tongue stop, and they'll have something on their hands they didn't know existed. They'll have time on their hands. They'll be spinning around, drunk as skunks, drunk as skunks heads screwed on backwards, and then Dr. Big Nose is going to smell their breaths wrinkle his forehead and spin down the hall in his wheelchair on the way to the goddamn heavenly choir. I think we have time for 
just a few more. Um, I'd like to, to shift the mood a little bit. Um, and in order to shift the mood, let me share this with you. This is a, a poem about the midnight train that goes from Petersburg to Moscow, or Moscow to Petersburg, which is the most fancy train and highly totted train in Russia, uh, the Red Arrow Night Train. And one time my wife and I were in Russia and we were on this, traveling on this train looking for a beautiful evening and night uh, in the luxurious uh, atmosphere on our way from Petersburg to Moscow. And this is the poem. It's called Midnight Romance. On the midnight train from Moscow to Petersburg, we aim for romance. A milky glass of tea straight from the samovar, the boreal forest sliding backwards beside our compartment window, a uniformed steward to serve shots of vodka for us to knock down, our two pale bodies tangled on crisp sheets. But we stumble into an airless sleeper packed with partially dressed Orthodox priests in their elbows and abdomens and an angry conductor twists us into another car and drops us into the berth number six like stunned turtles in a terrarium. The French in number five and the pair of, sec of Texans in number seven say that, uh, say number seven is dirtier than their horse's stalls. They rub broken glass into their grief outside our door. We just aim for relief, but giant mosquitoes prick us, especially you, and the toilet's odor is heavier than virtue. And our attendant smokes behind a newspaper in his seat. Shall I ask about the comfortable climate control in the brochure, or mention the lack of towels in the tank -like, to the tank-like woman who barks at him? And you promise me, with 12 volcanic bites on your face already swollen, that you'll die of anaphylaxis before we arrive. Why doesn't anything work? You insist that I, or the repellent, equally impotent, smash something, anything. The embedded sweat of thousands of Soviets seeps from every surface and surges against our window wrapped in woolen blankets right up to our faces. We eat the last of the cheese and granola bars. The train shudders and a voice announces in Russian, attention, romance is about to begin. And here's a, a, po a poem that's a little quieter, um, a little more gentle. It's called Montaza Gardens, Alexandra. And this is in Alexandra, Egypt. On the corniche, a brightly colored knot of children begs an American woman to repeat their names. Habita, Nima, Usani, Ife. Smiling pink scarves push closer an impish boy asks her, do you live in a mansion? Can I come to New York? Behind them, the bay's flat arms open, and on the horizon sit scribbles of the distant city, concealing its squalor and violence. Among the orange and azure robes and giggling girls, one wearing a niqab, 
stands a head taller than the others. As I place a frame around these children, much like the city frames the park, in the park its lovers, she raises her hands, palms out, thumbs together toward the camera, as if to frame her invisible face to photograph me. Through the slit, I see the bridge of her nose, her luminous eyes. I think I'll And this is one more poem. Um, and it reflects on one of the real tragedies in American history, uh, the Vietnam War. And in Ho Chi Minh City, which used to be Saigon uh, at the time we were devastating Vietnam, um, there is a something called the War Remnants Museum. And at the War Remnants Museum, there are old tanks and helicopters and fragments of sewers and various things, as well as thousands of photographs. This is one of the photographs. Um, and so this is a reflection on that experience. It's called War Remnants Museum, Ho Chi Minh City. The bulk of the remnants are photographs of crimes. A naked girl whose skin is on fire from splotches of napalm. A vacant hillside with dead trunks, relics of Agent Orange. Larger remnants sit on the grounds outside, an American Chinook aircraft, a Russian-built tank, a fragment of sewer from Thang Thong in which three children hid. Some remnants have sprung into being since then, in carts and wheelchairs and braces at the building's entrance, a chorus of song-filled children playing instruments with their toes and prostheses, living remnants of hubris, as is the ingot of shame in my heart. During the applause, they nod their heads and smile at the audience. I'm going to end now with two poems. Um, one is written for my friend John Wright, who may possibly be uh, among the audience tonight. Um, and it's based on a, a, a sentence, a comment that he once made, said, and I, at least I remember him saying it, it, it may, I may have distorted it, but uh, it's called Regarding Kindness. Still failing to put kindness ahead of righteousness, says an old friend, taking a kilogram of blame for condemning his child's reckless decision. Fallen from the narrow beam of grace, my friend feels empty at a loss. 
I remember the click, click of my father's walker approaching the kitchen and my neck stiffening in anger. He stood at the doorway, craning his puffy eyes for company. If I had wrapped my arms around his chest. My grandson wraps his arms around my chest. An envelope appeals, appears in a rusty mailbox. The last poem um, is called Retrospective. And let me This poem is a, a sonnet. I do like to write, write poems that uh, are based on traditional form. Uh, in The Talking Cure, this, this book that you see uh, in the image, there are a number of sonnets and a few villanelles and even some weird things like sestinas and pantoums. Um, but tonight I've read all poems that really don't have traditional form, except this one. And this is a sonnet. It's a Shakespearean sonnet. And it, um, it kind of looked as a reflection on 40 years of medical practice. And as I say, I'll end with this. Forty years passed, his body replaced its cells with the exception of his heart's persistent pump and the mushroom-like paste of his brain. Pony scattered synaptic charts of his internship remain, etched in myelin, a few of them deeply. Nonetheless, a dried umbilical cord connects that powerful wound to the aging man across a gulf as wide as imagination. He doubts there's a thread to follow, a blockaded door to open, or a fusty corridor down which to tread to a solution. Those he hurt, the woman he killed with morphine, more than a few he saved. His ally, Hope, will have to do. So thank you for listening. And if anybody has questions, I'll be happy to try to answer them. Thank you so much, Jack. That was amazing. I was just thinking how lucky we are to have you, Maria, our entire board of such gifted poets uh, sharing with us here, especially. and. I know we've all been holding an applause. I, I don't know if you saw Jack, but everyone's clapping towards their camera. So I just want to make sure that we get that in before our questions. So if everyone wants to unmute for a moment and just give the round of applause we've been waiting for. All right. Thank you. So much. It's amazing. And I also, I'm just gonna come back for one second while we're getting our uh, questions in. Uh, at the end of the program, I'm gonna mention all of the upcoming events. We have an event just about every single week on Zoom. Uh, in those links that I posted, you can find it for that. Uh, I just wanna remind everyone to mute. Let's see. There we go. And uh, Dr. Dan Coolahan is actually going to be leading a reading and discussion group. It starts on August 5th. It's going to be uh, four weeks. It'll meet on Wednesdays from 1 to 3 p.m. And it's called Existential Quandaries. And each week uh, covers a different existential question. And we just started promoting this this week. It's really exciting. Uh, you, if you look in the Zoom link that I sent on there, I actually put another one 
just straight to that page. And it's super exciting. We really, we're broadening our horizons here with the types of events that we're able to have and that one especially. And you'll see the readings there each week, you'll learn more uh, about each one of these questions. And then you'll have a discussion led by Dr. Jack Coulihan about all of these topics. So definitely check that if you're interested. There's a registration page there. It's $10 for the entire series. And we hope that we'll see you there as well. All right, Jack, I'm gonna come back to you. And we have a great crowd here. I remember you were saying to me, well, I know 13 people are showing up for sure. And I said, I already know it's more than 13. We have all these pre-registered people. So <laughs> we did very well. And I can read you some of the questions if you like. Let me just make sure I'm starting at the top because I've already seen a few in here. Okay. Uh, JNB says, I'd like to know how often he shares his poems with the patients themselves and or their family. That's a good question. Um, when I was um, in practice and younger, um, I uh, would um, sometimes share the, the poems with, with patients. And in fact, it just so happens, uh, it's, it's a coincidence, the two of the page, two of the poems I read tonight, I had shared, well, one with a patient and, and, and the second one with the patient's family. The one I shared with the patient was called, uh, I'm going to slap those doctors. And it turned out that this guy became my patient, uh, treating his, his uh, chronic obstructive lung disease uh, after this surgery. He kept bringing up this, uh, incident. He was so angry at these guys, these surgeons. Um, and th that's kind of what gave me the idea for the poem because it, this kind of was, was eating at his, him all the time. And, um, and he, you know, he was a guy with a chip on his shoulder. Uh, he was, you know, um, didn't like to be pushed around by doctors. So um, I did write the poem and I, I gave it to him. I, you know, I, gave him, uh, and he was he, like overjoyed. I mean, he really was. And then later it was published in the Annals of Internal Medicine and I gave him that. And he had that thing for years. He had folded it up into his wallet and, and carried it around in his wallet. So I, I tend to think that that was probably the most therapeutic uh, thing I ever did for him. Um, so poetry therapy, I think, worked in that case. The other one was the man with stars inside <clears throat> who died really within a day or two after that uh, incident. And uh, I, I gave the poem uh, to his two daughters, um, which I, I think was very, um, I hope anyhow, was very helpful to them. Uh, in their grieving process. So, so I guess the, the answer to the question is I have done that sometimes. Wonderful. And then we have another question from JND. How has inspiration for po your poems changed since retirement? More time for <laughs> question. <laughs> well, um, it, it actually has, uh, and I think it's changed more slowly. I mean, it's not like I retired one day and then everything about my patients kind of disappeared. Uh, but as the years have, have passed, I find myself more uh, writing more um, poems. For example, the, the poem about uh, Vietnam, which was a first, I wasn't in Vietnam. Of course, I lived through the, the Vietnam protests and, um, and, and um, so my poems, I think, have tended to maybe try to maintain this same sensibility, but not so much with specific patients. Like, for example, tonight, the, the poem, Take Off Your Clothes, um, would be an example of that. All right, and our next question 
comes from Susan Fishbein, who is another wonderful member of our Board of Trustees. Good to see you, Susan. And she asks, what is your writing process? Do you recollect images and themes from prior notes to self, or do the poems just flow upon personal inspiration? Well, I, I think inspiration is, is overrated, uh, um, at least in my case. Um, I tend to, uh, there are some poems that just kind of come out almost fully grown, so to speak. But I think that's a relatively small minority. Um, most of my poems start with some image or uh, line or, or phrase that invokes uh, something in my memory. And then I'll, I'll kind of sit down and work with it. Um, I have to admit, I, 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 although I do write notes out, I uh, basically never um, sit down and write a poem. Well, I've done that occasionally when I was on vacation, but I, I always work at a computer. And I find it, um, I find it so much better than trying to write uh, a poem uh, by hand because you can you can continually change things you know you're not you don't have to kind of strike a line out and then rewrite it and and so forth so um uh, uh my process i guess is is i i forget who said this i'm sure probably anyone uh writer who's asked is uh, you know 10 percent inspiration and uh, ninety percent um, just sitting there and working at it. Um. Wonderful. Uh, okay, so now I have a comment from Andrew Flesher, who says, "Jack, what a treat! Superb, timely reflections. As usual, you say the most with the least. Beautiful and poignant. Thank you." I would have to agree. Thanks, Absolutely. Andy. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mary Phillips says, wonderful, thank you. Herbert Swick says, Jack, superb as always, thank you. Michelle Poole says, when did you start to write poetry? And do you find that writing poetry is better using photos? It's a good question. Um, when, uh, you know, I wrote, I remember writing poems. I, I must have started in high school. I did start in high school. I don't remember anything before high school. Um, and I wrote poems in high school. Uh, mostly I was uh, trying to imitate um, people like T.S. Eliot for some reason. I mean, he was very popular then and I was kind of thought myself an intellectual and all that. And then the other reason I wrote poems is, is to impress my girlfriends. Um, I wrote poems in college uh, and, and, and to, but a, as time went on in medical school and after medical school, very, very few, uh, more or less just um, occasionally. But it was in when I was in my mid forties, I think, uh, that I was inspired uh, actually by a patient uh, who, one of my patients in Pittsburgh, who was a poet herself, um, inspired me to, um, to, to kind of re renovate my uh, poetry. Uh, and she was very generous uh, in, reviewing my old poems and, and uh, critiquing them. Um, now I realize that when I say that, it's kind of unprofessional to share personal things with your patients. And I have to, I think, plead guilty on that respect. Um, but I'm happy with the outcome. Oh, and the other question, um, there was a second part to that question. Yes. 
the second part is, do you find that writing poetry is better using photos? Oh, um, well, actually, uh, there was a, a poem I was going to read based on a poem, based on a photo tonight, and I, I skipped it because of time. Uh, but I've only written a few, um, few poems based on photos. Uh, I, I don't do it very often, um, but I'd say when I, when I have done it, it's because something just jumps out at me. And um, in that case, I, I tend to write the poem pretty smoothly without too much work, uh, but, but I don't do it that often. And I have a nice comment from Marilyn London. And Marilyn says, I'm sorry I have to go. My groceries are being delivered and I have to <laughs> control my dogs and put things away, which I think, I think that's a great one to read just because we can all, you know, sort of commiserate <laughs> with that as we are at home right now. Uh, but Marilyn says, thank you so much for allowing me to join this event. The poems are amazing. Have a wonderful evening. Uh, then we have a comment from, one second. Okay, Iris Grinek says, I really liked your use of images during the reading. Great job with the technology, which I would have to agree. That's also really wonderful to be able to share a visual with the audience as you're reading. Uh, and then we have a comment from, or a question from Robert. Robert says, did you revise any of the older poems before including them in the talking cure? Uh, the answer to that is yes, um, and I can't um, I, I can't list them or point them out. But um, many of the poems, especially from the uh, earlier books, my first book came out in 1991, my first poetry book, uh, and uh, another one in 1995, and and, and so on. And those early books. Um, I've included some of the poems that, that have been uh, revised. Um, so yes. All right, and then we have a question, well, two questions from James Montrin. James says, the late Harold Bloom indicated that great poets wrestle with their predecessors. Which poets do you wrestle with the most and which poets Slash poetry disturbs you the most. So wrestle with disturbs with or disturbs oh. you the most. <laughs> well, boy, that would take some thought. Of course, you know, the 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 dean of or maybe godfather of American physician poets is William Carlos Williams. Um, and I I do wrestle with him. Although my my style, generally speaking, is is quite unlike his, and I couldn't say he's a favorite poet, uh, but I I do take issue in, in some cases with his his um, characterization of of patience and and so on. Um, I think you would say today, and this is a comment on today's um, kind of cultural um, situation, that uh, William Carlos Williams, of course, took care of uh, a lot of immigrants in, in uh, Rutherford, New Jersey. That's where his practice was. And uh, he was, they were poor people and um, Italians, uh, black people, and um, and if you look at his poems, and even more so in his short stories, um, I think people would take issue today with the words that he uses, maybe the stereotypes that he uh, evokes. Um, now that doesn't make him less of a poet or less of a great writer. Although I assume that there are people today who would 
we would say it does. Um, but my among my favorite poets are probably my very favorite modern poet is Seamus Haney. And uh, I guess his, what he, the, I love his use of Anglo-Saxon uh, direct words, his, his sense of beauty, uh, of rhythm and, and music. And I, I do try to emulate that. I don't know that I can specify a, a single poet that I don't like, um, but I, I really can't, I mean, I, my limitations really are that I can't understand a lot of contemporary poetry that you see in um, journals, um, literary journals uh, that really doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, it's just kind of a bunch of words. And um, that indicates probably my limitation, probably if I were, um, had a broad enough literary experience, maybe I would understand them and, and appreciate them. But I like narrative poetry, poetry that tells a story, or uh, lyric poetry that is clear and, and touches the heart. Um, different types of poetry. Different types of poetry. Oh, I'm just going to remind everyone to stay muted. And once I finish uh, reading these questions, Jack, you can also come on camera if you're feeling brave and you want to share or something or let's talk about your experience listening here tonight. You definitely can do that. I just want to get through the written questions first. Um, let's see. James Montron asks, is there a poem that you want to write but have been unable to write as of yet? Hmm. Yes, actually. Um, I told you about the patient of mine uh, back, it's been more than 30 years ago now, who uh, tried to, who helped me really become a working poet and was willing to critique my poems. And she would give me um, kind of prompts. And one of the prompts that I remember is write a poem to the brother that you never had. And I'm an only child, so I have no siblings. Um, and I have struggled for 30 years trying to write to my uh, brother who doesn't exist. And I hope someday I'll be able to. I'm an only child too, so I don't even know where you would begin <laughs> something like that. I don't know. It's an interesting idea for sure. Uh, let's see. Uh, Michelle Poole says, I loved your poetry because it certainly gave me a great insight into medicine and what the medical people endure on a daily basis. And Susan Fishbein asks, what have you discovered about yourself through writing poetry? How did your poetry inform your medical practice? Um, well, I, I, what I discovered, I think, is that um, shutting out the part of me that wants to write poetry is not healthy. And so I, I need to keep working at it. Um, the question of whether poetry, um, writing poetry makes you a better doctor, I think that's something we could discuss for hours. Um, you know, I teach medical students and we, um, we do use poetry. Uh, and we have an elective where medical students do write poetry uh, as part of their coursework. Um, I think that 
you know, that not everybody <clears throat> is kind of attuned to write poetry. And that's okay, you know. Uh, there are people who uh, love music and, you know, have talent for music and people who have talent for football and so forth. So <clears throat> I don't think it's fair to say that, you know, you should like um, become a poet in order to become a better doctor. But I do think that um, if you're inclined to be able to express your um, feelings and the emotional components of your experience through poetry, uh, the practice of doing so, um, I think enhances that part of you. And I, I guess, you know, if you're inclined to be empathic um, by practicing empathy, you become more skilled at being empathic. And I think, you know, there's, there's something in that. I, I'm not sure that I can uh, pinpoint it, but um, it certainly has helped me, let's say. Okay, and then I have two more questions and then we're going to be done with the text questions. And if anyone wants to come say hello through their video, they're more than welcome to just after these last two questions, okay? Uh, JMB says, are you still working with John Fox? I know you have a poem in this book, Finding What You Didn't Lose. That book led to me becoming a poetry therapist. Oh, yes. Um... I, I know John, um, and not, we're not working to get, we have done workshops together. Uh, I don't, we haven't done any recently, um, but I, you know, we possibly could in the future. Um, John has, if you, if you look at my website, uh, there's a link to John's uh, Institute for Poetic Medicine there. Um, and he's, John has been a, a friend over the years. Um, and as you say, he's used some of my poems in his books. Um, I guess that's it, yeah. All right, and our last text question is, you have an Egyptian print on the wall behind you. <laughs> Are there any specific mythological or even high Hieroglyph hieroglyphical well, the, the, the Egyptian print on, on the, this wall here uh, to my uh, right um, is actually on papyrus and uh, it I bought it in um, uh, Giza well not in Giza in um, Saqqara which is south of Giza uh, and it portrays the, um, I guess, what you would call the ancient Egyptian last judgment. Uh, and you can't see the whole thing, but basically what happens is Anubis, the uh, god of death, brings the soul uh, and it gets weighed against a feather. And um, if, I can't remember, whether it's supposed, I think if, if it's lighter than the feather, then you get to go into the eternal realm where Osiris is the king. Uh, if it is heavier than the feather, um, you're out of luck because then the crocodile god eats you and you no longer exist. So if, if you, I, I, I don't pretend that that has any, uh, I think it's of interest, <laughs> but um, it doesn't really relate to my poetry. <laughs> All right, we had so many good questions. And before we start with our questions on video, I just wanna make sure that we give another round of applause to Dr. Jack Coolahan. He's been amazing tonight. I know we've all been holding it in again. So thank you so much, Jack.
Okay. Let's just make sure that everyone's muted unless you're coming on video, in which case you can unmute. We just want to be able to hear everyone. Let me give everyone a second. Any questions that we didn't answer yet? Go right ahead. We have so many wonderful people. I see so many familiar. Yeah. It's wonderful. I just wanted to comment um, that to Jack that I really appreciated his um, poem on the radiation accident about the kids in Brazil. And it was very heart wrenching for me because um, I didn't know it actually happened. And which is why um, the more I study history, the more I think there are parts which need to be told and there are parts which are missing. So I really appreciate him for um, actually writing that poem about the kids' radiation accident because I'm going to actually find out more information about it. I didn't know it actually happened. It's sh quite shocking, isn't it? Yes, it was the, um, as I understand it, at least at that time, I think that was 1986. It was the worst um, radiation accident since Chernobyl. Um, I believe that was in the uh, in the paper that uh, from which I found that incident. Yeah, there's so much history in there too. I just love that we're learning so much through your poetry. And I had never heard of that actually either. The Brazil incident. Well, it does remind us um, in a very striking way about the, um, the side effects, the complications, the unanticipated damage that a lot of our modern uh, techniques in, in medicine can cause. Now, certainly that's an extreme example, but uh, I think we can all know examples of how um, complications can develop because things have become so complex and communication in medicine is is not very good. I mean, there's a, a real problem of communication amongst healthcare providers. Uh, and so I, I think our patients are often exposed to iatrogenic damage. Absolutely. And if anyone else would like to come say hi or share a question or anything like that. Give a second for that. Uh, can, could I ask a question? Yes, absolutely. Uh, from down under, long way. <laughs> we, we basically are living in a bubble down here in Tasmania at the bottom of the earth with basically no local transmission of COVID at the moment. So we are looking at what happening is happening in the United States with great sadness and great grief. My question to Jack, apart from sending greetings from down under, is to ask what do you think poets are going to make of the current COVID tragedy embracing the world? Well, Narelle, I, I don't know. Um, I think one good thing that we could we could possibly um, hope for is if you remember the Black Death in the late uh, 1348 and, and thereafter, uh, in which about a quarter to a third of Europe's uh, people were killed or died, that was followed by a great rebirth. Uh, that's when Boccaccio wrote 
uh, Rabelais, uh, the, um, the Renaissance occurred, the rebirth of, uh, or the restoration of, of ancient learning and so forth. So I guess one thing you could hope for is that um, at least from a, a kind of intellectual civilizational point of view that things it might stimulate, uh, it might shake us awake and, and stimulate uh, new ideas and new growth. Um, that's not a popular view uh, here in the United We're, States right now. We, we are seeing that already in Australia, that, that hope. Yes. Of, of, of a newness and doing things differently, thinking differently. I think from the point of view um, and I think most of us here uh, uh, on this on this uh, session are American, and uh, I think that uh, at least the possibility that all of our multiple tragedies in terms of our Black Lives Matter, our economic collapse, our uh, pandemic and, and, and our violent uh, disarray as far as politics are concerned, that um, this might be a, a wake-up call uh, for us to become more serious about um, our lives and, uh, and about our stewardship of the country and of the uh, at least that, that's what I hope. Thank you for the question. Yes, that was a wonderful question, Narelle. And it actually reminded me, we have a collaborative poetry project coming up that people can submit their poems to. And it's just about well, Corona and it's just about the time in quarantine and what everyone's going, been going through. And that will be an excellent example too of poets' reactions to current events. And I'm gonna post that link right so, now in case anyone's interested. So I would like to um, end you know, by saying that uh, I really appreciate all of you who have tuned in tonight. Uh, I think you're a wonderful audience and I just am sorry that we aren't be able, to, we can't share this in person and have that um, kind of connection that we would have if we were all in the same room. So, so thank you for um, participating. Thank you so much. Oh, yeah. Just one last quick thing. Um, it's not a question, but um, I live in Australia, Melbourne, but I follow American politics and I won't go on, but all I can say is, God, I hope they're going to make some changes, you know. <laughs> You know, it, it's just so much, I've been following it, you know, and, and there's so much, where do you start? You know, no matter who's the president, they've really got a really tough job ahead of them. That's my opinion anyway, you know, because there's so many issues. Where do you start? Yes. yes. Well, it's, um, it is, it's kind of the, the, the worst political situation I think we've had in the last, um, I don't know, 100 years or more. Um, and I, but I, I think on the other hand, I think most Americans are reasonable and common sense, intelligent. Um, and I think that, that what's happened is demonstrates, I think, the, the vulnerability really of a, an entire country to be damaged seriously by, um, by a series of events that, uh, you know, a populist kind of appeal to ignorance and hate and 
And I think this is happening in Europe as well. Uh, but I, you know, I, I, I feel pretty confident that we're going to be able to overcome it. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Jack. We really appreciate it. It's been a wonderful conversation with multitudes of layers, as you can see. So we're so thankful okay. to have you. All right. So thank you. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Caitlin. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 I'm going to come back for a moment. And I want to remind everyone to join us next week on Thursday at 6.30 p.m. I'm just going to read really briefly. We have three poets with us, uh, three female poets that released their poetry books during the quarantine. I just want to give you a little description because I don't want to confuse any of the details. Uh, Susanna H. Case will be with us. And her new book, Dead Shark on the End Train, has questions of gender and violence threaded throughout her poems. Jamie McCarty uh, recently released The Minuses, which is an eco-feminist book of poems concerned with endangerments to women and ecology. And Dana Patterson recently released If Mother Braids a Waterfall, and it's a book obsessed with motherhood and daughterhood, ancestry and transition of home, family, faith, and the narratives woven to uphold the self. So I think that sounds like an amazing event. I can't wait to learn more and hear their readings next Thursday at 6.30 p.m. Eastern time, because I know everybody's got a little different time zone going on. And just briefly, I also want to mention our other two upcoming events. Um, the following Thursday on July 30th, we will have a local Long Island poet, Russ Green, with us. And Russ is amazing. He actually worked so hard to bring the poetry community around us together. Uh, he's works on all these open mics and opportunities for poets. And we're so happy to be sharing his poetry here. Uh, he doesn't get to perform enough. He mostly is helping others. So we're just excited for that. He'll be with us. And last but not least, we just announced one more event that should be a really great one as well. On Friday, July 30th, we're, uh, sorry, Friday, July 31st, we will have a uh, distinctive Whitman scholar, Ed Folsom with us. And he's joined us for a lot of events. Uh, we had a conference on Whitman last year. He's an amazing scholar. He knows so much about Whitman. And he's going to be uh, introducing the topic of Whitman, race, and racism. Um, and it will be a discussion, actually. And he'll be covering uh, various parts of very contemporary issues and having to do with Whitman and Whitman's time. Um, he'll be discussing Black writers' responses to Whitman over the past 125 years, and a current conversation about the Whitman statue that's situated at Rutgers University Camden, that's in New Jersey, right near where Whitman actually lived in his later years. And he'll be giving us more facts so that we can think about Whitman more in context uh, when we think about the Civil War era and all that's going on today when we're starting to think more about these sculptures and uh, you know, how we should approach our history as we learn more. So definitely join us for that. Thank you so much, everyone. It's such a pleasure to have you with us. Um, again, you can email me anytime if you have any questions. If you want to be part of our uh, weekly email blast, please email me. I'll add you on there. Make sure you get all the current events. And thank you again. We'll see you soon, I hope. Have a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you, Caitlin. Thank you so much. Thank you.